Well, sure. Uh, it wasn't in the 90s at all. In fact, it was, I believe the correct year is 1956 at Dartmouth uh, College. Uh, and it was called by, uh, uh, headed by uh, John McCarthy, who was a, a na- uh, later was at Stanford University at the time was, I guess he must have been at Dartmouth. And um, he uh, created a proposal for what he called the Dartmouth Summer Conference on Artificial Intelligence and invited a number of different people who were working uh, in areas that involved the attempt to uh, build computer programs that engaged in behaviors that normally one would think of as requiring uh, human uh, intelligence or reasoning. Um, And so uh, a bunch of guys got together for the summer there. And uh, the title of it was uh, the Dartmouth Summer Conference on Artificial Intelligence. And that was the invention of the term. So that's when the uh, whole field got started. (laughs) Well, okay, that's an interesting question. Um, Since I was in 1956, I was four years old. I didn't have a whole lot to do with it. Um, um, But I first got involved in artificial intelligence in, uh, I guess, formally in uh, 1974 when I, I... began a PhD program at the University of Pennsylvania in computer science specializing in artificial intelligence. And I got interested in the field primarily, the biggest influence uh, at that time on me was a film called 2001, A Space Odyssey by Stanley Kubrick. Uh, It's a very well-known film. And uh, I believe that was 1969, might have been 68. And uh, the film is uh, had inclu- includes a computer called the HAL 9000, and the HAL 9000 was an artificially intelligent machine, uh, and was critical to the plot. I don't think you want a whole lot of detail about that here, but I was very interested in the fact that uh, it might be possible to build such machines. And so, after I graduated college uh, and decided to go into graduate school, I decided to make a specialty in that area. And that was very early. There wasn't too much going on at that time, 1974, when I began that effort. Um, But that's how I got involved. Um, Sure. Well, let's start with why I'm optimistic. Um, The new, new type of artificial intelligence is called generative artificial intelligence. And it's a breakthrough in AI. Basically, where specialized computer programs find patterns in very large collections of data and then use those patterns to project new data or to fill in holes in the the data you have. And as you're probably aware, these programs can engage uh, with people in a human-like conversation. So they can do things like draft documents, legal briefs, uh, product brochures. They can even write decent poetry. So um, the technology also can generate very realistic pictures and videos, which people are very well aware of. Well, this is going to have a lot of very valuable applications. And so uh, I I think it's uh, very optimistic about it. Um, The way to take the way to view it, though, is not that we're building machines that are like people, but rather that the machines that we're building are a new wave of automation. And just like previous waves of automation, that's going to have the several interesting effects, one of which is to make us all in general, I should say on average, a lot wealthier, uh, but it's also gonna change the nature of work. So it's gonna impact a lot of different uh, job areas. And I'm not overly concerned about that. I mean, I might be if I was in one of those jobs, but uh, the truth is that um, this is uh, the history of automation has always been about the transformation of job markets. And we're going to see that continue. I don't think there's any danger that we're going to run out of jobs for people. There'll be plenty of jobs for people. On the other hand, um, you may have to find different kinds of jobs or develop new skills. So, um, you know, that that's why there are certain types of jobs, which I think people are going to have to rethink how they do them. And in particular, that would be uh, what I might uh, call creative workers are going to have the greatest short-term impact. So uh, these are things like uh, creative workers that that uh, do uh, write Hollywood scripts. 
Now, it's not going to completely replace uh, writers and artists and musicians, but it's going to make them a lot more productive and allow other people to create those products uh, much more quickly and easily. So we're not going to need, need as many of those people. Now, to me, that's not as scary as it sounds because photography, by way of example, did the same thing to painters. And recorded music did the same thing to musicians. And yet here we are. And, you know, human creativity is as highly prized as ever. Um, other areas that are going to be uh, revolutionized by uh, generative artificial intelligence are fields like education, because these systems can be used to tutor students on an individual basis. Um, there will also be uh, the healthcare and the law and computer programming and many other areas where these systems are going to be tremendous assistance and very helpful to people. So um, uh, I, I think you know, those are the jobs that uh, we're likely to see automated. Well, I, I don't think uh, really that this technology represents any kind of existential threat to humanity or that these systems might uh, revolt and die, decide to exterminate us. That, that's, you see this all the time in TVs and movies, of course, but it's just not a realistic concern. Generative AI systems are computer programs and machines. They don't have minds and they don't have needs and desires. You know, they're not going to want to drink up all of our fine wine and marry our children. There is no they, so they won't be coming for us. But uh, that said, we certainly can build dangerous systems and unleash them, you know, on ourselves. And if that happens, it's really on us, not on them. Uh, there's just no reason to believe that these systems will as suddenly kind of grow and take over uh, there's so many mistaken assumptions behind that uh, that ridiculous scenario that uh, I think it's it's something we don't we shouldn't really be wasting time uh, talking about. Unfortunately, we have to because there are people who are who are promoting it. You know, one of them is that runaway intelligence. That intelligence is one some kind of linear scale that just goes off into uh, infinity, and you can have a machine that is infinitely intelligent and therefore can manipulate and outwit everybody. Um, I don't think there's any evidence for that whatsoever, and it's not something one typically finds in nature. I think we'll have very intelligent machines. We already do. They'll have very broad knowledge. Uh, they already do have that, and they'll be very helpful in lots of ways. But it's not like they want to do something or they have a desire to take over. Uh, that's not what these things are about. They're tools, pure and simple, and we can use them for good and we can use them for bad. Uh, so um, I'm not myself worried about that. I'm worried about what people are going to do with the technology, not what the technology is going to do to us. Well, uh, I don't think there's any way we can ensure that, uh, you, to, to repeat the word that you chose. However, I do think that it does need to be regulated because there are some very uh, unpleasant and destructive uses of the technology. And like any technology, we're going to want to try to uh, mitigate those negative consequences while we still get the benefits of the positive aspects of the technology. I mean, we do this with every technology. Uh, just, let's just take cars as an example. Um, we have all kinds of restrictions, regulations on cars, not the least of which is you have to have a license in order to operate one. And they have to meet certain safety standards and they have to have lights for operating at night and things like that. Well, that's what regulation is for. If we didn't have that, you know, anybody could just get drunk and get in a vehicle and drive it anywhere they want on the right or the left side of the street and uh, cause all kinds of havoc. So there's nothing new about having to regulate new technologies. And generative AI is a powerful technology, and we will need to uh, regulate it. So one of the areas that uh, we're going to need to regulate is what are now being called deep fakes. And those are pictures or video or voices that look real, but that aren't real. You know, it used to be that seeing is believing, but that's no longer true. These systems are going to be used by scammers and, and criminals to persuade you to send them money by faking the voice of a friend or relative. And this is already happening. There are real cases of this happening, of people using this new technology to fool pe people to steal their money. Um, another area is that the uh, technology can be used to spread disinformation and lies. And... Uh, 
And that's going to be a big problem because we're going to be buried in, in spam that's customized to our individual interests and our individual tastes. So it's going to be a lot harder to detect that and to deal with it when those are generated by a in computer program that is designed to try to get this to, uh, to your attention and to hit on issues that are a great concern to you. You know, another problem is that uh, in contrast to most computer systems, these systems make mistakes. And they do it in, in very human ways. You know, most people think that computers are very uh, good at math, but uh, the, these systems are bad, tend to be bad at math and bad at problem solving. And they tend to make up answers when they don't know facts. And this is what's called uh, hallucinations. So we're going to need regulation to uh, help with all of these different problems to make it illegal or difficult uh, to uh, use systems for these purposes. And... Um, you know, we'll have testing that's going to be required for certain kinds of systems. We may have certain uses that are prohibited, for example, to create deep fakes of politicians to fool people into thinking that they said things that they didn't uh, didn't say. And those are all very, very real issues. Um, you know, another one is that uh, the systems can can exhibit bias and discrimination. And the reason for that is not that they are biased or discriminatory, but these particular human uh, frailties, they're really reflected in the enormous training sets that these, these systems are created with. So you, you wind up codifying all of the, uh, you can codify uh, bad attitudes or discriminatory attitudes into these systems, and it, you don't really even realize that that's happened. So um, this is a big issue in employment law in today, and they've come up with various fixes for this. Uh, and making it illegal to discriminate. Similarly, I think that that will have to be applied to these kinds of electronic systems as well. Well, let's, let's distinguish two types. Those that are being generated by uh, actors who are um, operating within the normal legal system. And the other is, of course, actors who are not operating inside that system. So we can pass laws here in the United States that make it illegal to spread certain kinds of disinformation suitably defined. Um, and Or we may pass laws, which I think is more likely, that uh, computer-generated outputs have to be labeled as such. That's not just for disinformation. That would be for any information. And if we do that and um, people take that seriously and look at the warnings, uh, I think that can help to uh, mitigate that problem. But then you have the problem here in the US of foreign actors that uh, are not subject to US laws and that hide their identities. And because of the way our open society operates, they're able to manipulate or inject information into the a political discussion in the U.S., and they may be doing so in violation of U.S. law. And uh, being able to control them in some way or to even to identify them is often very difficult and problematic. Um, so, uh, you know, I think we can pass laws, as we did with uh, spam, for example, spam email. Today, uh, anybody who sends you a message has to have if it's unsolicited, you have to have an opt-out option somewhere in the email, and they have to also identify themselves in certain ways as to how they can be contacted. And um, I mean, generally that system works for much of the mail that is sent unsolicited from legitimate places. But there's a lot of mail that's uh, sent uh, from illegitimate sources, and they don't contain those kinds of uh, uh, they're not abiding by those laws, having opt-outs and things like that. And, and uh, you know, that's a continuing problem uh, uh, today as it has been in the past here in the U.S. Well, it's, it's a bit of a broad question because um, each of these things is different, consciousness, uh, free will, uh, et cetera. Um, but as a quick summary of my views on this, I would say that Either machines and people both have free will or neither of them do. And you can make an argument on 
each side of uh, those two positions. But it's very hard to say, well, people have free will, but machines don't. Because I think if you look at the mechanics of how our brains work and compare that to the mechanics of how uh, computers work, uh, you don't really have a difference that is uh, is important or is material to this question of, of, of free will. Um, so uh, furthermore, there's been some very good recent work. Uh, I would recommend a book by uh, Robert Sapolsky called Determined uh, that is makes the case that we really, although we feel like we have free will, in some sense we don't because every decision that we make is caused by some internal thought process or our experience or our biology that causes us to make a decision one way or another. So the, the, the common sense notion of free will that everything in the world up to this point doesn't matter and you have an option to do whatever you want, uh, unconstrained by your past or your history or physics or biology is simply not true. And therefore, in a technical sense, human beings do not have free will. And the same, of course, applies to a machine because a, a machine uh, is a fully deterministic process. And uh, therefore, I think it's very difficult to say that that uh, includes some kind of free will. Now, that's just one aspect of many on this philosophical uh, array of, of topics that one can uh, discuss. But I think it's one of the most interesting ones and also the one that is most subject to people having a uh, an opinion that is uh, not accurate because it's not really uh, thought through in terms of uh, you know modern science and what we know about the way the human mind works. <laughs> okay. Oh, related to this technology. I wasn't ready for that question, but uh, let me see. I'll see if I can give it a try. A short-term prediction. A short-term prediction is uh, that the next generation of generative AI chatbots will uh, have much less of a tendency to make up answers to questions which are false, to present things as facts that are really just uh, in, the, in the machine's imagination, if I can speak loosely about it. Because right now, this problem is called, it's called hallucination. You know, you can say, you know, give me, uh, give me five books, names of five books that were written by Jerry Kaplan, and uh, they can spit it out and maybe they'll get three right, and they'll have two that aren't my books at all. Um, I think that problem is probably going to be uh, greatly mitigated in the next you uh, turns of the crank on this technology in the next year or two. So that's, that's my uh, near term, uh, near term uh, uh, projection. Longer term, I, I think that we are going to find probably 10, maybe 20 years from now, that when you want to get the most accurate, informed, uh, object, objective, and thoughtful answer to some difficult question, people are going to be much more inclined to turn to a machine to answer that question than they are to turn to a human being. And that will be a real shift in the way we think about the nature of expertise and our relationships with the technology that we have created. 